The Sob of the Lay Figure by Emmerich Hume Beeman Published in Phil May's Illustrated Annual of 1902 Read by Bethina On a certain bright morning, early in April, a young man found himself sauntering idly over the parapeted bridge that spans the Seine, not a stone's throw from the gardens of the Tuileries. His name was Theodore Ray, and his occupation might almost have been determined from the negligent, though not untidy, character of his apparel, and from a certain conscious ostentation with which he would at times caress a wavy yellow beard that hung down to his waistcoat button. In point of fact, he was an artist. The past few months he had been spending in Italy, where he had derived much satisfaction and a little profit from the study of the many works of art which are to be met with in that country, and he was now making his way back to his home in London by such easy stages as a man of leisure and sufficient means is able to afford himself the luxury of adopting. There were yet several hours to be wasted in Paris before the Calais train started, and after wandering aimlessly through the city, Chance had at length directed his steps to a small side street leading out of the larger one that runs along the south bank of the river, and almost parallel with it, towards the Palais de Justice. It was in this street that his attention was presently arrested by the wares exhibited in the window of an unpretentious-looking curiosity shop. Among other articles exposed to the approval of the passer-by was one which particularly engaged his interest and had, indeed, been the cause of his stopping before the window. This article appeared to Theodore Ray to accord singularly ill with its environment. Surrounded on all sides by objects of unattractive aspect, odd jumbles of antiquarian refuse with here and there a scrap of old theatrical wardrobe, or an incongruous relic from some second-rate museum, it seemed to stand out the more conspicuously from its neighbours, and almost to advance a mute claim upon the sympathy of the beholder. Theodore Ray permitted himself to gaze on it for some minutes in an attitude of pensive criticism, while his hands passed meditatively over the silky threads of his beard. There was something in the article that appealed to his feelings as an artist, but he was conscious that there was something else that appealed to him rather as a man, and it was this consciousness that confounded his criticism and at the same time strengthened his resolve. He entered the shop. The interior of it was dingy and the atmosphere charged with that peculiar musty smell which alone inhabits the establishment of second-hand dealers. Behind the counter, the proprietor of the shop sat in a rickety chair reading a newspaper, and as Theodore Ray pushed open the door and walked in, he looked up at him with a mild start of surprise, as though the advent of a customer was the last thing in the world that a man in his position might be supposed to expect. "'Good morning,' said Ray, politely." At your commands, monsieur, replied the man, perceiving suddenly that his customer was a well-dressed young foreigner of an appearance not inconsistent with the possession of cash and possibly an added capacity for spending it. He rose from his chair as he spoke and made a bow. You have in your window a lay figure, began Ray. Without doubt, monsieur, it is, as you say, a lay figure of exceptional perfection. Theodore had not said so, though he may have thought it. He did not, however, trouble to correct this trifling misrepresentation, but contented himself with observing, I am an artist. The man spread out his hands with a deprecating gesture, as one who would imply that the fact mentioned was too obvious to require assertion. The face of monsieur expresses it, he remarked. Ray smiled, not a little pleased, it may be, by this tribute to his vanity. And, he pursued, I am disposed to make a purchase. 
The man bowed again. The lay figure, monsieur? Exactly, the lay figure. It happens to be precisely suited to my fancy. And I am come to inquire whether it chanced to prove equally suited to my purse. Of that, monsieur may rest assured, replied the man briskly. Considering the perfection of the lay figure, its adroit workmanship, the beauty of its proportions, its almost lifelike aspect of its liniment, its... Stop! said Ray. Its recommendations I am as well able as yourself, my friend, to determine. I desire only to know its price. As I was about to observe, monsieur, considering all these points, the price is nominal. Merely nominal. Name it. Truly, what would monsieur be disposed to give? inquired the shopman. Nay, what do you ask? The man appeared for a moment to be reflecting. Then he gave a sidelong glance at his customer. In effect, he observed, I find that there is no sale for lay figures, monsieur, in this quartier of the town. I would be glad to get rid of it at a moderate price. You shall therefore have it for a hundred francs. It is de cheap. Theodore Ray could scarce restrain a slight gesture of surprise. The sum named was indeed ridiculously low. This tradesman, thought he, is either strangely insensible of the value of his wares, or else he must be a person of strikingly liberal character. Providence has evidently directed me here in order that I may benefit by this remarkable instance of commercial urbanity. Aloud, he replied, Good, I will buy the figure. A bargain is a bargain, replied the shopman, and monsieur will do me the justice to admit that I am selling him the lay figure dirt cheap. I myself paid nearly as much as a hundred francs for it, yet there is no demand for such things here. I bought it at the sale of the celebrated artist M. L., who, as monsieur is doubtless aware, is but lately deceased. As he spoke, the man withdrew the lay figure from the window and Theodore Ray had an opportunity of admiring more closely the wonderful delicacy of its workmanship, the symmetry of its shape and the beauty of its waxen features. The figure was that of a female and from its head there hung a wealth of rich, soft hair. The mask of the face was singularly lifelike. The eyes were blue with lids half drooping beneath their long black lashes. The mouth was large and dainty-lipped, taking at the corners a gentle downward curve that lent a somewhat pathetic expression to the countenance, and the countenance itself might indeed have been cast from the face of a very beautiful young girl. As for the limbs, they were fashioned so humanly as almost to create a feeling of uneasiness in the beholder. Ray was anxious to complete the purchase and be gone. He pulled from his pocket a bundle of notes and counted out a hundred francs. The shopman gathered up the money while a smile of satisfaction spread over his features. It is a bargain, he repeated. For monsieur, he added. At that very moment a stray cab chanced to be passing down the street. Ray hailed it and instructed the shopman to place the figure in its case with as little delay as possible. When his eye fell on the case which the man produced for this purpose, he could hardly repress a little shudder of repugnance. The shape of it bore so close a resemblance to a coffin. However, he said nothing, and presently both case and owner were driving rapidly in the direction of a large central hotel. The appearance of the box did not fail to excite a certain degree of comment, and more than once Ray found it necessary to explain to the porters, both at the hotel and the railway station, that it contained nothing else than an ordinary lay figure. He felt indeed that he might, with greater justice, have described it as an extraordinary one. The night was clear and calm when he embarked at length upon the Channel steamer. Theodore remained for some time on deck puffing contemplatively at his cigar, for he was in no mood for sleep and preferred the cool air of the sea to the atmosphere of the crowded cabin. But the boat had not proceeded very far when a sudden and singular change transformed the aspect of the sea and sky. 
The gentle breeze a few minutes ago rose to a wind and the wind swelled momentarily into a gale. Dark clouds gathered overhead till a threatening pall hung above the vessel and not a star was visible. The waves leapt angrily against the side of the steamer which presently began to plunge and roll in the trough of the sea, labouring heavily. All around was tempest and tumult. The passengers, huddled together in the saloon, gazed at each other with anxious faces. For three hours the tempest raged. Then, with an almost equal suddenness, it subsided, and the steamer breasted its way gallantly into Dover Harbour. Theodore Ray stumbled up the companion ladder, and as he walked towards the gangway he passed the captain, who stood near the bridge, wiping the spray from his face and talking to a passenger. Rough, my dear sir, the captain was saying, I have had 20 years experience of the channel and I tell you, I never remember a rougher passage. There might almost, he added with a laugh, have been a corpse on board. There might almost, Ray found himself repeating mechanically as he crossed the gangway, have been a corpse on board. Then he laughed too and the next moment shuddered as he remembered the lay figure in its box. He breakfasted early the following morning and on descending to inquire after his luggage was surprised to find himself confronted by a knot of whispering porters. They cast suspicious glances at him as he approached. Why now, what the devil's the matter, thought he. One of the men drew near and touched his cap uneasily. Beg pardon, sir, the fellow began, but does that there coffin belong to you? Coffin? exclaimed Ray angrily. What do you mean? Well, anyway, that black box, said the man, pointing to the packing case of the lay figure. Me and my mates have been listening to it. I beg your pardon, said Ray. You and your mates have been what? Listening to it. It's been a groaning away to itself all night long, and if there ain't something inside it as hadn't ought, we should be much obliged to you if you'd just kindly lift up the lid of it, sir. You astonish me, exclaimed Ray. The box contains nothing alive at all. Well, anyhow, we're a going to open it, said the man doggedly. Nothing alive, maybe, he muttered half to himself. Why, you donkey, cried Ray in considerable indignation. Do you imagine that I am a conveyor of contraband corpses? Don't you go for to call me a donkey, replied the porter. It's been a groaning, I say. Just you be good enough to open that box, sir, or we'll call the police. Theodore was sensible enough to perceive the inefficacy of argument. He concealed his annoyance at the man's rudeness with a shrug and a smile. Certainly, he answered, if it will satisfy you, I will open the box. The men grouped themselves round him as he undid the fastenings, and when a moment later he raised the lid of the box and disclosed to the astonished gaze of the porters a lifelike wax figure of exceeding beauty lying motionless within it, a murmur of surprise ran around. It's a lay figure, explained Ray with some complacency. It's like a pretty dead lass, remarked one. Not so dead neither, observed another. Look at its eyes are staring up. Perhaps you would like to convince yourself that it is a lay figure by feeling it, said Ray with exquisite irony. You can shut it up, sir, said the first spokesman, turning away a little abashed. But we certainly thought as we had heard a deal of groaning going on. Nonsense, said Ray. The incident, however, left an unpleasant impression on his mind and he was not sorry when at length, and without further annoyance, he reached London. He drove immediately to his mother's house in South Kensington and was welcomed by Mrs Ray with every expression of kindness and affectionate solicitude. His first care was to unpack the lay figure and bestow it in some safe place. His next was to exhibit it with some pride to his mother. Well, it is certainly very pretty, observed the lady critically. But my dear Theodore, isn't it a little, er... Uh... If you are referring to the indelicacy of its attire, my dear mother, that, of course, is a matter that can be easily remedied, returned he. Attire? Want of attire? It has nothing on at all, exclaimed Mrs Ray. 
It might almost be a live young girl, she added, scrutinising the figure through her eyeglasses. Ahem, said Theodore. Yes, almost. Mrs Ray turned away with a slight blush and changed the conversation. Theodore was disappointed. Women can never distinguish between art and nature, he thought. If, however, he was disappointed at his mother's lack of appreciation the preceding day, he was still more perplexed by her attitude towards his new possession the next morning. Almost her first words to him at the breakfast table bore an unflattering reference to the lay figure. I must request you, my dear Theodore, to remove it, she said. Remove it? Remove what? asked Ray in surprise. Your lay figure. I really cannot have it in the house any longer. Upon my word, why not? he inquired, sipping his tea. Did you not hear it? demanded his mother. Pardon my obtuseness, did I not hear it? I was kept awake last night by the most extraordinary and uncomfortable sounds, explained Mrs Ray. I am not a fanciful woman, you are aware of that. I heard unmistakable sounds, my dear Theodore. Indeed, of what nature? Well, to put it briefly, I heard someone walking up and down the passage outside my room. Now, I could not have been mistaken. I heard it. I heard more. I heard a girl sobbing. Do not tell me that I could have imagined it. That is quite absurd. I never imagine things. I heard somebody sobbing quite distinctly. The servant, hazarded Theodore meekly. Possibly she walks in her sleep. Nothing of the kind, said Mrs Ray. Or was crying in her bedroom. I believe servants do sometimes. The suggestion is childish. Well, then I give it up, said Theodore. You will at least oblige me by taking it away, replied his mother severely. Theodore knew that it was as useless to argue with women as with porters. He acquiesced, therefore, with as good a grace as he could in his mother's unreasonable demand. Women can never distinguish between fancy and fact, he murmured to himself, and the same morning bore off the lay figure to a small studio which he rented in Bayswater. He occupied himself for the remainder of the day making rough sketches of the figure, yet his pencil could achieve nothing to his satisfaction, and the more he worked, the more discontented he grew with his results. Something eludes me, he sighed. What is it? Can it be the expression, the contour, the soul? His reflections were at this point interrupted by the sound of a gentle moan. He raised his eyes with a sudden start. The lay figure was gazing down upon him mutely from its pedestal, but in the room there was nothing save the ticking of an eight-day clock and the still companionship of his model. I want fresh air, he said to himself and seizing his hat, he hurried from the studio. For an hour, he wandered idly through the crowded thoroughfares, passing up one street and down another with the purposeless gait of a man who walks only for the sake of walking. But in whatsoever direction he chanced to bend his steps, he was conscious the whole time of a mysterious impulsion beckoning him back towards the studio which he had just left. So strong was this feeling as to excite in his mind a corresponding degree of antagonism to it, and he resolved that he would not yield to the inclination to return. He repaired instead to his mother's house and took afternoon tea with her. Throughout this homely meal, Theodore betrayed so marked a degree of preoccupation that even Mrs Ray could not fail at length to observe the singular abstraction of her son's manner. Indeed, it was growing more evident each moment. He exhibited a restless uneasiness, an abrupt and monosyllabic tendency of conversation, an inattention to his mother's discourse, which were in sad contrast to his usual courteous and amiable habit of behaviour. Mrs Ray attributed these symptoms of indisposition to the fatigues of the preceding day's journey, and Theodore did not attempt to undeceive her. He rose shortly to go. I may not return home tonight, he said. I have work to do which may keep me late. 
and I should not wish to disturb you, my dear mother, by a midnight arrival. I will sleep at the studio. Do not overwork yourself, was Mrs Ray's parting injunction. On no account, replied Theodore, and bidding his mother a filial farewell, he drew a deep breath of relief to find himself once more in the street. The remarkable impulsion that had assailed him earlier in the afternoon and had been growing in insistency ever since attracted him now with still greater vehemence and drove him straight back to the studio in Bayswater. He unlocked the door and hurried up the stairs. Entering the room, his first glance was directed towards the lay figure and no sooner had his eyes lit on it than he uttered an exclamation of surprise. There could be no doubt whatever that it had changed its attitude. He had left it with its cheek resting on its hand and its elbow supported by an upright. He found it with the arm fallen forward on its support and the head drooping downwards in a posture of the deepest dejection. The position thus assumed was so strikingly natural a one that for a moment Theodore gazed upon his model with a sentiment of positive embarrassment. Then he lit a pipe, threw himself into a chair and sat gazing at the lay figure while his fancy busied itself with strange conjectures. Engrossed in this employment, he slipped presently into a state of delicious drowsiness and just as he was in the act of determining to rouse himself from it, he fell asleep. When he awoke, the room was dark. He struck a match and lit the candles. The hands of the clock pointed to half past eight. He stretched himself with a yawn. Too late, thought he, for dinner, and he looked at the lay figure on the pedestal. Why? he ejaculated and rubbed his eyes and looked again. It has moved! Indeed, the posture in which he now discovered it was an entirely different one from that in which he had remembered to have seen it last. Whether this peculiarity was due to accident or a slight defect in his own memory, he could not persuade himself. The fact remained that the lay figure was sunk on its knees in an attitude of supplication, its hands clasped before it, its head bent down, its long hair in disorder over its shoulder. It is the most singular lay figure, muttered Theodore, and he proceeded for the tenth time to place it in some new position. As he did so, the notion struck him that the long soft hair over which his hand passed caressingly was even longer than it had appeared to be two days ago. The notion of the hair of a lay figure growing appealed to him as an idea so comical that he burst the next moment into a fit of laughter. In the midst of it he paused with the sound of merriment frozen on his lips, checked, arrested by another sound, a sound soft yet distinct and full of infinite reproach. He looked up sharply at the figure. Why, what's the matter with her? he muttered. The eyes of the model were still cast down, its beautiful head bowed, and only its attitude eloquent to reply to Theodore's question. He walked around it, studying the figure as it were from every point of view, yet with the eye of the artist merged temporarily in the eye of the student groping after metaphysical effects. He was conscious of a growing frame of mind strangely antagonistic to common sense, but even while he acknowledged the folly of it, he passively yielded to the influence of this seductive humour. He began to cheat himself with playful and romantic fancies. It had not escaped his notice that gradually his thoughts had come to transpose the pronoun of reference from the impersonal to the personal. He smiled a little as he again repeated, Why, what's the matter with her? His imagination had endowed the model with the charm of a definite personality. She was too beautiful, even regarded in the abstract as the mere expression of some once lovely phototype, to be denied the distinction of sex. His fancy, still playful, assigned to the figure a conscious identity, and with mock gravity he followed up the conceit by a certain deferential homage of treatment. 
It may be, he reflected, that her modesty is offended by this exposure of her fair limbs. And he thereupon cast round the model's shoulders a long flowing robe and fastened it so that it hung down to the dainty feet, half covering them. After which he retreated a few steps and bowed to the figure. Perhaps that may satisfy, madame, he smiled. And by your leave, madame, he added, I will now partake of a little refection before retiring for the night. He drew from a cupboard some light refreshments which he proceeded to consume and then, as the hour was getting late, he presently put the light out and flung himself onto a small iron bed in the corner of the studio, proposing to sleep. He had scarcely closed his eyes when he heard, issuing from the direction of the pedestal upon which the model stood, a low sob. He lay still and listened, wondering. The sob was succeeded by another equally low, infinitely sad, and again another, dying away into a deep, long-drawn sigh. "'God preserve me!' ejaculated Theodore. "'She's alive!' He leapt from the bed in a state of intense agitation, and groping for the matches, hastily struck a light. The glimmer of the candle revealed to his gaze the dim outline of the lay figure, standing exactly as he had left it half an hour previously. If there's a mystery here, he cried, it shall not at any rate catch me asleep. And he lit every candle in the studio and arranged them round the model in such a way as to make it appear to be surrounded by a perfect solar system of its own. Then he drew a chair opposite to it and sat down, his eyes fixed on the figure before him. He was conscious now of the strangest conviction of a living presence a consciousness which once and for all dissipated the levity of his previous attitude of thought. He waited only for some direct manifestation to justify this conviction, while he fully recognised the irreconcilable anomaly between the actual fact and the unaccountable impression. He preserved his vigil, unmoved and patient with the irresponsible faith of a Buddhist devotee who awaits results beyond his control, to Theodore, no results came. The morning found model and artist in the same positions. Yet the impression on Theodore's mind remained, and after breakfast he sought out a friend upon whose sound practical judgment he had long been in the habit of placing an implicit reliance. This friend was a young medical man of a gravity and with a professional reputation considerably in advance of his years. To him, Theodore confided the whole story of his purchase, omitting no single detail of his experiences from the moment he had first gazed upon the lay figure in the shop at Paris till the moment he had left his model two hours previously in the studio at Bayswater. "'My dear Ray,' said his friend when Theodore had finished his recital, Many doctors would tell you that the impressions you have received have been the mere outcome of some nervous delusion. I am not even myself sure that in telling you this they would not be telling you the truth. But I am not one of those men who insist on reducing all phenomena to a practical or scientific explanation. I am of opinion that around us is a world of mysteries that neither medical science nor intellectual research can penetrate. To discredit what we cannot disprove is the error of the narrow-minded. Besides, your impressions have been corroborated by another, your mother. Take me to see your lay figure. The doctor accompanied Theodore to his studio. He looked upon the model with an expression of the deepest interest. He passed the soft tresses of its hair through his fingers. Then he glanced at Ray curiously. Well, said Ray. A very perfect representation of the female figure, replied the doctor slowly. I may add a very beautiful one. Have you noticed the hair? It is long and soft, observed Ray. It is human said the doctor. Ray started human. His friend nodded. Yes, it is human hair. There was a moment's silence and both men stood gazing at the figure, each deep in his own thoughts. Suddenly the doctor turned abruptly to Ray. 
How much did you pay for it? he asked. A hundred francs. Will you permit me, for the same sum, to dissect it? My dear fellow, it is in your hands. Very well, said the doctor. I will lose no time. In half an hour he had brought from his house a case of instruments. Ray stood by him. In silence the doctor proceeded to cut into the waxen surface. In silence he removed the first coating and revealed another. In silence, at length, he turned once more to Ray. There is your mystery, he said, pointing to the table. But the explanation? The doctor shook his head. That is beyond me, said he. Ray bent over the figure and shuddered. There had been something almost of sacrilege in this pitiless application of the knife, and what remained was no longer beautiful. The idol of his fancies was destroyed. What do you make of it? he inquired, addressing himself again to his friend. What do you? asked the doctor. A skeleton, said Ray. Yes, said the doctor calmly, a skeleton. A perfect human female skeleton, my dear boy. That is what I have made of your lay figure. Perhaps, he added grimly, it may prove after all to be a matter for the Paris police. Ray cast a glance of regret at the debris of wax and clay lying round on the table and floor, and the remark that fell from his lips seemed scarcely relevant. Poor child, he murmured, poor child. But the doctor looked grave. That was The Sob of the Lay Figure by Emmerich Hume Beeman. One of the class of ghost stories that start with a bargain in a junk shop that then turns out not to have been a bargain at all. Emmerich Edward Geoffrey Hume Beeman was born in India in 1864. He was the son of the Surgeon General. He had 18 brothers and sisters, some of whom became writers. He became a writer and journalist and author of novels and, as we see here, some short stories. I hope you enjoyed this story. His short stories are not easy to find, but I have located another one and I'll be reading that soon. I hope you enjoyed this one. If so, please remember to click the like button. And, as always, thank you for listening.